Hello, Mug Club and all you strange animals. I had the privilege of sitting down with Alex Jones to discuss the end times. Are we living in the end times that are spoken about in the Bible? What pieces are in place that make the end times even possible, whether it be Israel being in the land in 1948, the invention of satellite television for the whole world to watch the two witnesses being murdered, or maybe the precursor to the mark of the beast with chips being implanted right now into people's bodies? You have got to hear what Alex Jones has to say about this topic. It is absolutely fascinating. And look, all of this is only possible because of you, Mug Club. Remember, your support provides all of the opportunity for us to do this. And in fact, our show in general, which comes back August 14th. Remember, bookmark it next Monday, August 14th. We are back Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Make sure you are there. Listen, without your support, none of this is possible, but hold on to your butts. Alex Jones, End Times Prophecy, it is going to be interesting. Gerald apologizes apologetics. It doesn't mean that! All right, Mug Club, hey, everybody, thank you for joining us for Gerald apologizes apologetics. It doesn't quite mean what they say that it means. I understand that. They just do that to kind of, uh, I don't know, punk me because we spend all this money on the intros for everybody else, but not for me. That's fine. That's fine. I'll get over it. I'll be okay. Don't worry about me. I, uh, I had an interesting conversation back in June with uh, our guest today, and it, it was very quick on the show, and we started talking about demons and the mark of the beast, and I was like, huh, that, that's... That's eschatology. I'm very interested in that. And so, Alex Jones, I, I thought I'd come down here and hang out in your world and we could continue our conversation. I think it literally lasted maybe 60 seconds on air and we didn't really get into it a whole lot. Captain Morgan, you are now promoted to Admiral Morgan. Admiral Morgan. Sitting in this chair is a little weird. I mean, it's just like, huh, this is, this is kind of a nice place. I like it. No, I've I'll, seen this on, on, on the air. I, I love you in Steven's time. studio. And you you got to get Steven back down here sometime. I know. One of these days, we're going to get him in the car or maybe a little... Yeah, we've done time. shows out on the street together, but never in the studio. I remember that. You said something about bum piss, I believe, being... Yes. <laughs> I actually did you. throw up. It was so gross. <laughs> so is it just the smell of that? Yeah, just the smell of or it. Or the thought. And, and I was extremely hungover that day, too. So <laughs> let's not lie. No, no. I, I mean, I'm a lay person when it comes yeah. to end of the world type stuff. But I did go to a lot of church, a lot of Sunday school. I have read the Bible quite a bit. I know there's massive yeah. amounts of study. I mean, you could have five degrees in it and never know half of it. But my grandfather, uh, my mother's father, was really heavily into it, studied the Bible, Daniel and Ezekiel and, yeah. and, and, and a, a Revelation pretty much like five hours a day. He was really smart and, 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 a, and a, quite the historian. He'd been a successful inventor. Right. A lot of other things. But uh, the last 20 years of his life, he was dedicated to studying the Bible I remember him like breaking down the New World Order and global government. They'd have a computer and they would control everybody and you'd have to do what they said or you wouldn't get the mark. He would always explain, you don't just take it and then it's because you've taken it that you're going to go to hell. It's that taking it, you have to submit and worship right. and follow the whole system. So he would basically rant, kind of like Alex Jones, almost like he was my grandfather. <laughs> he would look like me, uh, just about this all the time. And I would uh, you know, come and visit him in the summers and then, and then I, I, I moved down here when I was a senior in high school Started hanging out with him and my grandmother almost every week. What what years roughly? What decade was this? Uh, I was uh, graduated out of high school in '92. Okay, uh, and so I moved here like in 1991, and so my grandparents lived here. Yeah, and he was just really big into eschatology, and so that that I mean I heard a lot from him. Well, the church used to be really big into it, and that's why I was really asking that because back in the 1980s, I mean, there was a lot of fire and brimstone preaching, and a part of that was telling the end of the story. So let me just tell the the, the guys listening and, and gals right now, we're we're talking about the end times. So eschatology is kind of the study of the end times, and just so you understand what that is, if Genesis is kind of telling the beginning of the story, which it obviously is. Uh, Revelation and some of the prophetic literature leading up to that is really telling you how things come to an end. And some of the things that Alex just said would have just been in the 1960s, 1950s, 40s, 1800s, you're crazy. There's no way any of that stuff could happen. But obviously we see a lot of it happening today and so people are very interested. It's apocalyptic. Anytime you see a History Channel show that talks about the apocalypse or something like that, people tune in because they're like, oh, there's something that draws us in to want to know a little bit more. And this subject is debated quite a bit, right? We were talking just a second ago about mid-trib, pre-trib, post-trib, no-trib, whatever. There are a lot of different reasons for you to care about this, right? We'll dive into just a very basic framework of what we're talking about. And then we're going to talk about specific segments, specifically 666, the mark of the beast, how that's being potentially implemented today and how uh, how you can make sure that you don't accidentally do that. You can't. That's the whole the, the kind of the trick to it. You can't accidentally take the mark of the beast. But we're going to hit a few more points. 
Maybe something that most people don't know is that for every prophecy on the first coming of Christ, which that is the Messiah, that is for the Jews, that's it, right? They were waiting for and looking for and desperately hoping for Messiah to come. For every prophecy on the Bible about Messiah's first coming, there are roughly eight concerning the second coming. There's eight more than the first coming, right? So it's multiple times more mentioned in the Bible. And a lot of people don't really take a lot of time to understand those prophecies or to really kind of think through it. They do take time to go, Revelation's tough to understand. Revelation's difficult because there's there's all this imagery that's being used and there's all this flowery language that I don't really understand. And we'll get into why some Christians have a bit of a problem with that. But it's important for you to know because God spent about eight times the time speaking about the second coming than he did the first coming. And obviously the first one was a big deal because it kind of saved people. Without the first coming, the second coming doesn't really quite matter that much because we would all be under judgment and I wouldn't want to be around for that anyway. But I guess my, my big question, Alex, is why, what made you start? So you, you talked about it a little bit. Was it your grandfather, you said? Yes. Uh, so other than that, was there any influence or was it just your grandfather's influence talking about kind of eschatology that made you dive into it a little bit? Well, I want to be 100% clear. I mean, the, the New World Order has brought us the end times and has proven the Bible's right. So that's why I've For gotten sure. way more interested I mean, growing up, we went to church on Sundays, and then we would have Bible studies a lot of times at the house on Sunday night when my parents led. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I could watch if I wanted to and hang out there if I wanted to. There'd be, not, there'd be like 20 people there, mm -hmm. but usually there'd be some other kids we run around outside. Uh, and we went to you know, uh, church on Wednesdays, uh, and we went to a evangelical style, you know, a, a pretty big church. And, and, and so I was just growing up with this as a background, and so it's kind of in the back of your head. Yeah. And then my grandfather, uh, once I moved to Austin, when, when I was in college, and, and then you know, having my job, and, and already on air for a lot of years, he, he died about 12 years ago, my grandmother about five years ago. He was just constantly saying, watch, this is all gonna be fulfilled. And he would get really upset when he'd see these preachers on TV setting a date. He would say, those people are deceived by setting a date. Then when it doesn't happen, that's gonna make people fall away. That's a tool of the devil. Right. And, and he was just really, uh, he said, you know, comes like a thief in the night, no man knoweth, you know, it's Christ of the hour right. of the return. And, and so then I've seen the left use that when this, these preachers get a bunch of attention saying it's this date for like a year, then it doesn't happen. Then they say, oh, the Bible's disproven. No, the Bible says no one knows. And if they tell you they know, that person's bad. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's all there. And so the older you get, the more you know, you go, this is incredible. Like, yeah. I get chills right now. <laughs> so I want to be clear. I'm not Mr. Preacher, and I'm not holier than thou. Uh, I mean, I don't tell lies on purpose, and I don't sell out to evil. But, I mean, I'm, I made the point about being hungover. That's probably why I was throwing up. I mean, I, I've got my own issues. I'm not perfect. I'm not on we some, all do. I'm not on some high horse. So yeah. many people are turned off by the church. Because it's 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 preaching a watered down uh, Bible, and it's it and it's it's also just attacking people individually instead of showing them the big picture. The devil's real, God's real. You better pick a side. And so p people right. ask why I'm so much in the end times is it's here, and it's all being fulfilled. And the globalists are fulfilling it and saying the future's not human. You will merge the machines. You will submit to all our social credit scores, our ESGs. You'll be tracked in live time. Uh, the, the Bible says everyone worldwide will see the image of the beast talking to them at once. They'll worship it, and that's television, holograms. Right. I mean, it's it's like there's no way John on the Isle of Patmos 2,000 years ago just made this up. No. There's no way Daniel just made it up or Ezekiel, and, and it's just all congruent, proving itself, proving itself, proving itself. And so if someone doesn't have the Holy Spirit of discernment, they read it as a bunch of gibberish. But once right. you actually are, plus we're living in the time. You said something so important that I'll shove for a minute, Gerald, and that is... In, in the in, in the seventies and eighties, I mean, there I was not just going to our church, but I would also go with my friends to their church, and, and it was like like there were all these movies and films, and people right. were, were really awake. There's going to be a one world government, and the beast system in Brussels, and a beast computer. It was Actually, everywhere. It, it was everywhere. And then once the nineties and the two thousands, and once it all started coming true, the preachers went whoa, because it's one thing to say the Bible says it's coming, and then it's kind of like science fiction and really interesting. But now a lot of the preachers are like, whoa, I'm not going to scare the hell out of people, which is actually we should be celebrating and going, my gosh, our God is real. Right. This is a warning. God gave us free will, but God also gave us a cheat sheet. Yeah. And, and so like, hey, kids, I want you to pass the test. Here, kind of here's the, so if you pay attention, you will. And so this is a big deal. And this it is 100% real. And, and then I think about the experiences I had in Dallas particularly, and then coming to Austin and then being around Hollywood, 
which never tried to be in, but it wanted me to be in it. Yeah. And it, it and it was Satanism, Luciferianism, sex parties, the whole nine yards. I never got into rituals, but I was picked up by chicks repeatedly trying to recruit me into things in Dallas and a decade later in Hollywood. Austin's more new agey, not a lot of that here. <laughs> uh, but, but that's almost more a more creepy form of it. Yeah. So so I've really, you know, I, I never fell away and said, I denounce God and God isn't real, I'm an atheist. But I mean, I was in points in my life where I wasn't taking drugs really, but I was drinking and a lot of women and yeah. you know, and, and, and on a power trip and really prideful about how, you know, I was, and, and I'd say I got, I'd say I was kind of corrupt, let's say maybe 14 to about 20. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and then I kind of rediscovered God and then the Holy Spirit much more stronger than when I was saved when I was about 10. And, and then literally God started talking to me and showing me things and like, and I would have dreams that came true and all these things. And I just, now I get stronger and stronger and stronger to where you, and you talk about spiritual warfare, we'll get into it. At this point, that's all we, I mean, that is, you have Christ, you have Jesus, you have a faith in that. Yeah. You are protected, but then the devil comes after people that you love who aren't in God. That's why you've got to get them into the Holy Spirit or the devil's going to chew up your family in front of you. So that's what people yeah. better understand. This is more important than guns in your gun cabinet or storable food or water right, is exactly. getting your heart and soul ready. Because believe me, folks, without God, you, you won't be able to withstand Satan. This is going to be hardcore. No flesh will be spared if God doesn't intervene. Right. And and I want to bring something back up that you said, and I'll get to that in just a second. What you just said, no flesh will be spared unless God intervenes. There's some great quotes for us that, that really help us in Scripture that say, that unless the unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman watches in vain. Like it doesn't matter. You can be as prepared as you want to be, but if God is not watching over the city, it really doesn't matter, right? It's it's a bigger picture than this. But churches did get away from this, and I think maybe because they started seeing people kind of practice this escapism, right? So instead of focusing on being productive here and now, right? What am I supposed to do today? What am I supposed to do in the next five years of my life if? by chance the Lord allows me to have those, they started looking kind of into the future and they were so heavenly minded that they were no earthly good is what my pastors would say every once in a while. But churches got away from preaching about Revelation and Daniel and some other topics that are very, very interesting and very important topics because it basically gives you the opportunity to point at scripture and go, God called that, right? In Ezekiel, when it talks about the dry bones and the, the nation of Israel coming back, like that's a that's something that has to happen for the rapture to happen, for the tribulation to happen. It talks about them having a temple and, and having sacrifices and then having the abomination of, that causes desolation set up. Well, if Israel isn't a country, if Israel doesn't have the land, there is no temple, right? There is no temple right now, but it's impossible unless they're there. Well, until 1948, that was impossible. Until modern television was invented, it was impossible for us to all watch the two witnesses at the Wailing Wall. And it says that when those guys are killed because they've tormented people for this period of time, just by speaking the truth and withholding rain to basically say, guys, you have to listen. Let me get your attention. No rain. Let me get your attention. Listen to God loves you. He wants to save you. They rejoice and the entire world watches them die. And then they exchange gifts like it's Christmas. And then they're brought back to life. And it freaks everybody out, obviously. If somebody was brought back to life after three days laying on the ground and we've been celebrating their death... It'd be a little weird. I'd kind of get freaked out too. I get it. I understand. But none of that technologically was even possible. And so when churches don't get into this, I think they're doing a bit of a disservice to their congregations because it, it's almost, think about what we have now with kind of the cancel culture, right? We're obviously both very familiar with how that works in our society. You create a vacuum. You start to create a vacuum where people go, okay, well, you're not talking about this. So I'm going to go listen to 15 or 16 or 20 other people over here talking about it. And I may not be grabbing good information, right? So when you start canceling people in our industry, you start pushing them off into the fringes, you can't easily point out the people who are absolutely out of their minds and go, you know what, don't listen to that guy. He's never been right before. The, 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 the end of the world has never come. He's predicted it 17 times. And people go, yeah, you're right. I can see that. I can see that this person's not correct and not a reliable person to judge uh, or, or to listen to, to kind of judge whether the world is actually coming to an end or not. And it actually does a disservice to people. So I think the church has done a bad job with that. Let me let me just lay a little bit of groundwork here. It's important that you understand this. It is not important that you debate this to the death with other believers. People tend to get into these things and go, you know what? I am a new King James Bible person or a King James Bible person. And there are no other translations that absolutely are the word of God. And you're a heretic and you're going to hell if you read the NIV. Right, they tend to kind of draw these lines where we shouldn't. We yeah, God judges the heart. Not, and Christ always talked about the Pharisees up there praying in public. He said, "No, right. you need to pray in private. It's about you and God." And I just want to be clear with people: this isn't about even the messengers here. 
The devil yeah. is 100% real. The operating system of the of the New World Order, the UN, is Luciferianism. They've got a Lucius Lucifer Trust that runs the prayer chapel at, at, in, in New York at the UN. I've had these people try to recruit me. And some of it wasn't just in high school or then later when I was in Hollywood some. It, it, it's happened since then. We're very well-known household names said, hey, we want you to go to this event in Reykjavik or this event in Switzerland, and, and, and it's new AG, but we're Lucifer's not really bad. We're going to call in Lucifer to fix the problems. So, I mean, I, I start thinking about how much of this we... I, I, Bohemian Grove. I sneak in there. Mm -hmm. I hear there's this ritual. They're doing a ritual to the devil to, to, under all these Canaanite names. It's like Ghostbusters or something, but for real. And I look over, and the old men are 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 more intense than when I was in Holy Roller churches. Yeah. You know, because Holy Roller churches, great people are like, oh, we love you, Lord. These people are like, ah. I mean, this is real. All I'm telling people is, I don't know if yeah. you've experienced stuff like this, but I'm telling you, if you've seen the stuff I've seen, and I know God put me in those places to see that, yeah. so I can now witness this to people, you would know that God is real. And I just keep hammering that, And and I, but what you said is critical. There's a mix. The whole rapture thing, okay, there's all this scary stuff coming, and the Bible's being fulfilled so far, because people could see it starting to be fulfilled in the 70s and 80s, yeah. technology. So people go, oh my gosh, this really is happening. And then people go, oh, but we're going to be raptured, so let's just go to sleep and stop looking at it. Yeah. And, and, and so it's a mix. Half the folks, or whatever percentage it is, a certain percentage are scared and don't really want to be bothered with it, because it is awesome. It is scary. It, it is huge. It's, 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 it's eternal. The big decision forever. And the other ones are just like, hey, we're gonna get rapture, it's gonna be fine. But if you really look at the Bible, I'm not gonna debate post, you know, uh, uh, mid no. uh, or you know, you know, pre. The issue is right there, we know there's a big awakening that of Christians later that turn against the Antichrist and then he starts killing everybody. So so we know there's gonna be a group that's awake before, a group that doesn't, a huge awakening during it. And, and and you correct me if I'm wrong. You say it more than I no, do. No, you're fine. And then the Antichrist is just slaughtering people. And it, you know, once he goes from nice guy to mean guy, and we're going to have the biggest revival ever seen in the middle of this. It's just so any way you slice it, folks, it's real. It's happening, and people better get serious. Yeah, absolutely. So let me let me just lay this out for you. And we're not going to debate it. I may ask Alex kind of where he falls down on this stuff. I, I really don't know. It's very complex. I just know that God's real and the devil's real. It's about to get it's about to get real messy. Yeah. One way or the other, right? So look, a lot of people believe in what's called a rapture. And if you're wondering what that is, that's a, a topic that's alluded to in Scripture. I believe it's 1 Thessalonians 4 that mentions being caught up to heaven, kind of in the twinkling of an eye. And there's a word that's used there, harpazo, right? And that's, that's where they talk about this rapture, like this instantaneous, like catching up to be with God. And then at some point, there is a period of seven years that's called either the time of Jacob's trouble, I think, in Jeremiah, or um, the tribulation, right? A lot of people look at the tribulation and are like, oh, it's a seven-year period, sort of. The entire tribulation is this seven-year period, but really, the, the really scary thing, Alex, is that the Antichrist, when he comes to power, is accepted with open arms. This person doesn't come in as a conquering kind of uh, uh, a dictator, he, he doesn't show in. up in red pajamas. Right, exactly. Right. He doesn't come in and say, you know, you have to follow me. People willingly do that. And before COVID-19 hit, most of you out there right now probably thought, like, there's no way the world would just kind of jump in lockstep on something like this and kind of give up their freedoms willingly and shut down the entire world economy and not ask really important questions. There's no way big tech would, like, completely censor genuine doctors asking questions about this stuff. There's no way that would all happen. Everybody's eyes got opened a little bit on how quickly we fall apart how quickly we are willing in times of trouble to welcome in somebody who may not have our best interest at heart. To <laughs> accept a great delusion, which exactly. the Bible says if, if, if the, the delusion was so strong it could even deceive the elect. What's the exact exactly. quote? That's exactly what it is. You nailed it. Sometimes you just got to believe in yourself, Alex. I mean, it's, I mean I've read this stuff a hundred times, but you're trying to get the quote exactly right. No, no. I, so I always loosely quote this thing. Like, I've got some scripture written down just to make sure that I get it accurate. But if you hear us talk about it, it's a loose quote. Acts 17, 11 was what I would always point you to. Don't believe Alex. Don't believe Gerald. Go and study scripture and see if it is true, right? That is that is what Paul, yeah. I, that everybody should do that. One of my favorite teachers, Chuck Missler, always talked about that. So do that and make sure you do it, right? All right, so this seven years. Three and a half really good years, then things switch, and three and a half really bad years, and that's what we talk about. That's the tribulation, that three and a half years. So this seven-year period ends, then there's a millennial kingdom, which is a thousand-year rule of Christ on earth, New Jerusalem, the whole thing, and then at the end of that, there's what they call the white throne judgment, new heaven, new earth, right? That's the basic layout. There are other things that happen in there that I'm not going to get into right now. Let the devil out for a little later. while again. 
<laughs> he does. And I don't know why. Like at the end of the thousand years, so Satan is bound and his, his, they're, they're thrown into the pit for a thousand years. And then he lets him out for a little while. And there's, again, there's this additional battle that happens. And then there's well, free the will. It's like, okay, you've had, you've seen nothing but pure goodness. For a thousand years. Now let's, you want to be, the, you know. It's almost like Adam and Eve all over again. You get to walk and talk with God, essentially, right? And now you have the opportunity again to fall away. And so there's this final battle. I don't know why. I have no idea why God does that. But I understand that God is good and just. And I trust him a lot more than I trust myself to figure this out. But that's true at the end of it. So some people believe that we're in the millennium right now. And if so, a lot of pastors have said, well, if that's true, then the devil's chain is too long because he's obviously on the march. Yeah, well, there's that teaching that supposedly Titus sacked Rome, I mean, sacked Jerusalem, and that was the end of the world then. I mean, it doesn't have all the technology, the mark of the beast. I, I just really don't see that. And it's not understanding the Olivet Discourse, right? That The Olivet Discourse, and I talked to my wife about this just a little while ago. By the way, she loves you. She's a big fan. God bless her. I married up. I was talking to her about that. I've earlier. heard you say that on air. You did. <laughs> You're a handsome guy, but she's quite the lady. She's fantastic. Um, in, in Luke, the Olivet Discourse, he's actually talking about, he's talking to Gentiles, right? So Luke is rent to, uh, written to Gentiles. And so this is Christians after the time of Christ leading up to 70 AD. And he's talking about this and he says, don't waste any time. When you see the armies around Jerusalem, flee the city. Don't even go back down and get your coat. Leave and get out of the city. That was the fall of, of Jerusalem in 70 AD when the city was burned. And, and Christ said that. He said, before this generation passes, not one stone will be there. 38 years later. That's pretty much exactly the same time that they were wandering the desert as well before they came into the promised land. So it's a very interesting quote. The generation had not passed, but people are like, well, wait a minute. The Olivet Discourse in Luke sounds very similar to the Olivet Discourse in Matthew. And so they get confused. Matthew is written to Jews. Matthew's whole thing was writing to the Jews. And it was talking about two different times. Jesus at one time was talking to the public during the day. And the other time, he was kind of having secret briefing meetings with his disciples at night. And so that's why there's some confusion about whether that actually already happened. And we're in a millennium or that there is no millennial kingdom. That's just really some kind but of really it's, 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 it's men looking at the same mountain range from different angles. Pretty much. Just, yeah. You're looking at the story and you're not taking into context who he's writing to. And also like very simple things that said, and, and before these things, this stuff will happen. And after these things, these things will happen. It's like, well, wait a minute. One says before and goes down this entire list. The other says after and goes down this other way. That's a different conversation. But we've kind of looped those things together and it's caused a lot of confusion. All you really need to know is there is a tribulation. There is a millennial kingdom. The Bible definitely discusses it. I don't allegorize it. I tend to take the Bible more seriously. And the more that I do that, the more that I see scripture being fulfilled. Well, it says that women will become men, men will become women, exactly. your children will be set up over you. It describes, I mean, it's all, it's like insane. Like none yeah. of that ever went on. Now it's it, like, when this is being written, people are reading this, this is crazy, exactly. this never happened. <laughs> and then it's it, <laughs> They're like, you guys are crazy, come on, really? Guys becoming women, that's just crazy. There's some effeminate men, but let's not go too far. So one of the other dividing lines is, you know, when in that period of time, the church is actually taken out. Is it before that seven years start? Is it at the midpoint, so before the bad time starts? Is it at the very end because Christians don't get to be exempt from the kind of, I guess, persecution that they've experienced? Well, it says the, the, the beast will wage war against the saints and overcome them. So if you want to speak against the, because to me it says Christ comes back, the archangel bounds Satan, and then the dead in Christ are raised, and then and then and then and that's the tribulation to me. To me, it happens at the at the at the end of the Battle of Armageddon. Okay. I mean, it seems to me like a ten year old could do that. But but so many Christians who believe in Christ and love God are holding on to that. I don't want to run them away. I don't want to say you're going to hell. I don't want to preach at you. Hey, if, if that's what you believe, that's fine. But then you're not going to be ready for what's already going down. Right. So. Your, your responsibility is the same as a believer or as somebody who's maybe interested in what, you know, I guess the Bible has to say about how the world is going to go. Because looking around, you're probably thinking, my goodness, things are not necessarily getting better. They're getting worse. I tend to come down on a pre-tribulation kind of viewpoint, right? And so let me explain why. Um, I don't, if you understand what the tribulation is about, right? If you understand what those last three and a half years are, it is God's final chance for the Jews. The Jews that rejected Christ, he said, I will return to my place until they acknowledge their offense and then I will come to them. This is God fulfilling prophecy from Daniel. It's the 70th week of Daniel that talks about this very specifically and not only predicts when Messiah will come, but also predicts this period of time that will be unlike any other time. Worse than the Holocaust, right? That's exactly what the Bible is describing because if you look at some of the numbers that it talks about for how many people will be killed, it is far, far, far worse. But this is the last chance of a loving father saying, I'm giving you one final opportunity. 
And I'm going to do some things. I'm going to tell you that I'm going to do them. So think of plagues of Egypt, right? I'm, I'm just going to start ratcheting up the pressure until finally you let go and understand that I am God and you are not. So that's one of well, the things. That's right. God repeats the same. It's like over and over pattern. again. Pattern. So to the Jewish mind, pattern is prophecy. So the Bible is not so much pattern developed and kind of laid down. The entire book of Joshua essentially is pattern for the end times. Think about this. In Joshua, you know, when they're talking about the, the city of Jericho and the battle there, and they march around the walls and then they scream and the walls fall down. All the kids know that from like Bible stories when you're, when you're a young kid. The part of it that we don't talk a whole lot about is this two witness part. They send in two spies. They don't get any actionable military intelligence because there is no battle plan that includes going in and doing anything. It's just walking around the city. You don't have to have any intel for that, right? The only thing that really happens is that Rahab, a harlot, and her family get saved. She's a Gentile. So two witnesses go in, two witnesses at the Wailing Wall. Gentiles get saved. Gentiles get saved. It's a pattern that God Which is Which then does down. with Christ later. Exactly. So it just lays down this pattern throughout Scripture. So uh, the next thing that makes me believe that, if you look at Revelation 3, it talks about the letters to the seven churches. And it actually starts in chapter 2. But in chapter 3, it comes to the church of Philadelphia. A lot of people will make a big deal about how these churches actually represent kind of church ages, so to speak. Like an apostate church or uh, a missionary church or an evangelical church or... Uh, a lukewarm church, right? So you can look at all of these and kind of study that. That's a really interesting thing to do. The Church of Philadelphia, it actually says, and I'll quote it here in just a little bit, it actually says that if you hold on, I will keep you, I will remove you from the time of trouble. That's very interesting. So it's the a time foreshadowing of the pattern. Of a potential, hey, it's possible that there's a rapture. Here's the important part. Hello, Gerald, I want to say, the important part, I, I hope... You, I hope it's pre, and I, I, I know. Right? I am praying that it's pre as well. Trust me, if you've read Revelation, I don't want to be around for the last three and a half years of the seven year. I don't want to be around for the first part of it because there's going to be this guy coming on the stage that everybody who's a Christian, if you're still around, you're going to know that's the Antichrist. Things are about to get really bad, and it's not going to be a fun time to be around. Like, the, and he's the, going to be healing people and miracles and in the last all, all the high tech. More, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Politically, he's going to come to power first and it's going to be just this sweeping thing can you imagine somebody from like romania or pick you know pick some country over in kind of eastern europe can you imagine somebody coming to power right now in the entire world just bowing down to this person and saying absolutely yes this person what just, is it the antichrist you studied more than i have what is what is he what's the devil able to do to make people go into this delusion and worship this guy so it's it's a time of trouble Right, so that's what we need. Historically, we've seen that with the rise of Hitler, with all of these different kind of dictators. A depression, a virus, or... exactly something like that. So this time of trouble where people are looking and willing to give up freedom for security. We've been willing to do that throughout history. So the devil comes up with a solution. Yep, there's a person who comes in and has the solution, can bring world peace, can unite people that you never thought could unite. And really, what marks the beginning of this is the signing of a treaty with Israel. And so Israel signs a treaty with all of its neighbors to have peace. It's a seven-year treaty, and that's where that seven-year tribulation. Well, it's kind of that's scary when Trump guy. was getting that done. I know, right? When he moved the uh, the uh, embassy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that was that was fantastic. But well, there was no was there was no peace treaty with yeah. the neighbors who. No, I mean, it was good what he was stuff. doing, but I'm just saying it was kind yeah. of still kind of like whoa, it's happening. Over here. No, but it's part of it, right? Yeah. And so Russia plays kind of a key role in this too in the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, or the, was the, it Ma Gog and Mog Magog. and Agog? What were the ones? Russia? Gog and Magog. Gog yeah. and Magog, yeah. It's Russia and its allies that typically people believe that are the, the armies that come down and invade. But really, the seven-year treaty is what kicks it off. So if you're looking for the start of this, either you won't be here, and, and maybe we were correct in thinking that the church would be pulled out, or you'll see a treaty signed and you'll be here, but only for the good part, or you'll be here for all of it. Either way, it doesn't change what you do. None of that matters. This isn't something that you debate. We, a lot of times, you know, you talk about different doctrines and people are like, I don't know if you have to be baptized to be saved. And I go, you know what? I don't know either. Thief on the cross, wasn't baptized. You know what I do know? Christ said to get baptized. That's all I need to know. I don't know what it does. Well, I don't that, I'm going to do communion. I'm going to get necessary. baptized. I'm going to do all Well, I mean, but here's the thing. Like, I don't have to know if that's salvific, right? If it's going to be a part of the salvation plan. I, I don't know. I just know what Christ said to do. Here, he says to be ready. You can't know the hour and the day, but you can know the season. Jesus actually holds people responsible and accountable for not knowing the time of his coming. That's what he was crying. Well, exactly. You don't know the exact before. time, but you know the season. Exactly. Right? And so the book of Revelation is actually God the Father revealing the plan to God the Son, Jesus, telling John on the Isle of Patmos. So many people don't catch that in the first couple of verses. This is the revelation to Jesus. From God. Right, it says that right at the start. At the very start, and we read right over it and go, okay, well, this is just the revelation to John. No, John is there as a witness to record. 
Now, he has a problem because he's seeing stuff that he has no idea how to describe. <laughs> but at the same time, he's doing his best. When he says that you've got something that spews sulfur out of its mouth and it's got the power to sting you in its tail. Okay. What does that sound like modern times, right? Spewing sulfur out of its mouth. Okay, people have conjectured maybe that's a tank. Okay, that sounds right. Soldiers behind it could be the tail because they have weapons and they can sting for the tail. Okay, if you're John and you have, you know, horses and buggies, how do you describe well, Basically describes all these really, flying these metal and things and, and mountains of fire. And, you know. It's hard to describe these kinds of things in a way that will make sense. And so John had a problem. He had to describe these things in a way that hopefully people would be able to understand. But again, the point isn't, was he talking about tanks? That's really irrelevant. The point is, there's a time of trouble, the likes of which the world has never known. World War I, people thought was the end of the world. They actually thought it was Called the, the war end to end all wars. Exactly. Except it was the war to start another war, right? It was insane. And people thought, oh my gosh, with World War II, this really does have to be the end. It is going to get way worse than that. That's what scripture... Yeah, think about World War uh, At least 25 million Russians, 22 million Germans died. Oh, yeah. And a lot of... 600,000 Americans. A mil, you know, I mean, it was... But the point was, we were... We were on the tail end of it. I mean, the Russians and Germans killing each other. We waited other. as long as we possibly could because trench warfare didn't sound like it was going anywhere. And it didn't. We were smart. Instead, we put our troops, that's why the Army Air Corps was so big, in big, big machines dropping bombs. That yeah. would seem smarter. It was insane, but people thought the world was going to end. And people thought that the Antichrist should be on the stage and ready to go. But it's just going to get worse. And that's not to scare you. But the Bible that's even says there you. are many Antichrists. There's right. models of it. Well, there has to be. Because Satan doesn't know when the end is going to come anyway. So he has to be prepared pretty much in every Satan's generation. Satan's not omnipresent. No, he has to be prepared pretty much in every generation to have an Antichrist. And this is, this is conjecture, so I'll be hold this loosely. But theoretically, that means that Hitler could have been the, By the way, Antichrist if the timing was right. Exactly. The spirit was ready to do it. Right. I'm not saying Gavin Newsom was the Antichrist, but... <laughs> but we, I'm with you. Let's go talk about this. We talk about Patrick Bateman or whatever. He just, re- to me, my Holy you know, the Spirit me, I look at Newsom and I go, that's the devil. I mean, yeah. like... My gut just goes, whoa, not just his actions. There's but I mean, evil there. And I, there's real evil there. Yeah. And I'm not saying he's the devil, but he's probably like a, I mean, there's whatever's running him is like a, I mean, like lieutenant to Satan. Yeah, exactly. We'll get into a little bit about spiritual warfare, but I think that is 100% spot on that there are people that are influenced very, very, very heavily by evil. And scripture talks a lot about that. So speaking of scripture, I just want to, we've mentioned the book of Daniel. I just want to read a real quick quote here and uh, we'll throw it up on the on, on the screen in post. We don't have it right now, so we won't be able to see it, Alex. But I'll read it to you. Sure. So Daniel 9, 24. This, so this is the 70 weeks of Daniel. So 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness and seal both the vision and prophet and to anoint the most holy place. Okay. That's, does it sound like that has happened? Has sin been put to an end? No. Okay, so 70 weeks. So we are not at the end of that 70-week period yet, or some of those things would have happened. Some of those things might be able to happen in the first 69, and then there's a pause, and then there's the 70th week of Daniel, which is what it gets into. Know, therefore, and understand. And this is, this is the prediction to the day of when Jesus would come and present himself as Messiah that so many people miss. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to coming of the anointed one, a prince, which is Messiah, there shall be seven weeks. Then from then for 62 weeks, it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And so that's talking about when they're building the city, when they're rebuilding Jerusalem, you're actually going to have to build with one hand and have a sword in the other hand. And I believe they talk about that a little bit in Nehemiah, right? So Artaxerxes Longimanus actually gives the decree for them to go and rebuild the city. And they do. So that's the beginning of the clock. And there's some really cool studies. Again, Chuck Messler does a great study on this to kind of go, okay, here's the day because we have good records on when that was. Now, how long is this weeks of years kind of period that they talk about? And he'll go into a study on that. We're not going to get into that now. Does it come down or right around now? No, it's talking about when Christ would come the first time. Oh, yeah. So there's something oh, no, very, like the Old Testament precursors the same way. Right. So this is Daniel saying, look, Messiah is going to come at some point. Got to get some agua here. Yeah, I'll, sure. I'll, I'll rat you out as she's coming in very uh, secretly no, and no, doing no, a great no, job. Going, My going. apologies. So Messiah is, is prophesied as coming here, right? And so the Jews are looking for the coming of Messiah because he's going to deliver them. And everything's going to be great. And they're not going to be overtaken by anybody. They're not going to be having all the problems that they are right now, especially when Jesus actually does come. They're being ruled by terrible people with the Romans. And they, they, they really were looking for their deliverer to come. And it's really interesting. I was talking to my wife earlier about this today. We... A lot of times don't understand what Jesus is doing because he'll heal somebody and he'll say, don't say anything. Don't say who did it. Don't 
don't do anything with this. Keep quiet. Be secret. Like he does that over and over and over again. When his mom comes to him at the wedding of Cana, one of my favorite miracles because I'm a wine guy, and says, I'm gonna, I want you to take care of this problem. Woman, my time has not yet come. Like I'm not supposed to do some of these things yet. Like, it's not yet. So Jesus constantly pushes back on this. And He's holding then, back on his power. He, and then there's one time where he demands it and commands it. And that's on the triumphal entry. On the day that Jesus looks out over the city and weeps over Jerusalem and said, if you had only known the time of your deliverance, basically holding them accountable for understanding the book of Daniel and saying, you didn't know that I was coming and this is not going to go well. I wish that wasn't the case. And how can they not deny it now when Jesus came and warned him and everything he said now came true? Absolutely. I mean, it's ridiculous. It is. And he actually said, some people came up to him, some of the leaders, the spiritual leaders, and said, make sure, tell your people not to do what they're doing right now because they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Tell them not to do that. And Jesus looks at them and says, look, if they don't do it, the rocks will cry out and do it. Creation will declare who I am because today's the day. And you should have been ready for that, right? So Jesus- Is that when he wrote it on the donkey? Yeah. But, but, it's an but, incredible- But how can the Jews- talking about that. I know they get mad about this. We love them to death. How, and a lot of them are coming to Christ. How can they get mad when the Messiah told them and then it all came true? I mean, it's but like- Jesus, like God knew this as well. God knew that they would miss this. God, you mentioned it earlier when people were, you, I think you were talking about them praying in public and making their, these eloquent prayers. And then you've got this sinner over there that said, have mercy on me, God, I am a sinner. That's the heart that he wants, not somebody praying in public for public recognition. Which repeats the pattern. King tomb. David really was sorry and, and prayed in yeah, private. Absolutely. Well, he prayed in private, but he, he wasn't making a big show of things. If he did something in public, like he danced before God without his tunic on, like he had pants on, but probably no shirt. He danced before God. There was nothing wrong with that because it was genuine. What, what God had a problem with, what Jesus, God in, in human form, had a problem with was fake belief, fake sincerity, fake piety. People who said one thing, did another thing, and then actually lorded it over kind of the, the laity, the, the people, right? And said, hey, you guys have to do all of these things because of God. And I am God's minister, but I'm, I'm cheating. I'm doing all these things that I shouldn't be doing. Uh, but don't worry about that. That's why he called them whitewashed tombs. Well, because Gerald, if, you, if you had a national, which you have with, with, with your great Stephen Crowder, if you had a national TV show preaching every week, I'd tune in. You're good. You're smart, man. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. But No, I would. That's what we're doing right now. I guess it's, I, I'm, I'm kind of chicken to the egg. I the Holy Spirit to say something because, you know. No, but I mean, I, chicken to the egg, we are talking to millions right now. So Well, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. No, and so and then it goes on and talks about um, a, a covenant that is made for one week. And this is where the week, kind of weeks of years thing comes in. Um, in, in, in Judaism, like there's, you can have a week of years, right? So it's, it, it's kind of something that's foreign to us. We say a week, we mean seven days. You can actually have that mean seven years, right? So it's just kind of a figure of speech. And so Daniel kind of gives that to us in verse 27. And make a strong covenant with many for one week and for half of the week. So the first half, so that you don't miss it. By the way, the book of Revelation says it three different ways. It says 300 and or I can't remember the number of days. It's like 1200 and something days. Three and a half years, and it gives you the months. It does months, weeks, years, multiple times to make sure that you understand it's a three and a half year period. It's 360 day years, though, which is very interesting to me. Somebody can do some research on that. I think there's a, a really interesting book out there, but I think called When Worlds Collide, that talks about potentially how the calendar can change around a little bit. But that's, again, that's. But that's, what do we say crazy. to the average person who doesn't even believe in God, but then really worships the system? What are they going to do as this world government comes in? that surveils you with AI and you've got to submit and follow everything it tells you or it takes your right to have a job or eat or live or travel and basically kills you. I mean, that is, you've got to worship the beast to get the mark of the beast. And so what do you think, what is, and we know the devil is the antichrist, but what is the beast system, Gerald, in your view? And then yeah. what is it we have to do to get this mark? Because like you said, you don't get it by accident. So how do you refuse it? You So you'll know. But the good thing is that you will know. Nobody will ever accidentally take the mark of the beast. And that was a question that a lot of people had. Like, look, with RFID tags, with, uh, I don't know, pull out your phone. Like, if you live in China, basically, you take out your phone, and it scans it, and that's how you buy stuff. That's how you see if you're qualified to get on an airplane or a train or get a car loan. Maybe go to college uh, if your ESG score, essentially, social credit, score, sell without it's it. social credit score. But nonetheless, I mean, it, it's all kind of one thing, I think. We, we've talked about the ESG stuff as well. All of that is the same thing. So people thought, oh, am, am I accidentally doing that? People thought barcodes because the dividers were sixes and it said 666. Yeah. And I'm like, look, it's not barcodes. Just because you go to the store and you buy some cheese doesn't mean that you've taken the mark of the beast. It will be 
a bowing down to a world system. Think of the story of Nebuchadnezzar and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There was a big statue over there. They bowed down before it and worshipped it, worshipped it multiple times a day. And they stood up and said, we're not going to do it, right? That's what you'll have the opportunity to do. It won't happen by accident. But the way the mechanisms for that to be carried out are being put in place right now. And that's what's incredible. You read Revelation and you're like, how do they do it? You worship it. You got to submit. And then you get the mark. It's not like you just agree to take it. You have to worship it and do whatever it says. They have all these patents where you're watched by AI in lifetime and you follow its orders completely or it's taken away from you. So you become a robot and turn your free will over and become an extension of Antichrist. Right. I mean, and and so God's like, yeah, you've cut yourself off when I made you and gave you all this creativity and all this freedom and free will. If you merge with this, basically marry the devil and put the ring on your finger of this mark, then, then that's it. You're done. Yeah. Well, and they talk about the, the, once you take the mark of the beast, you're right. You can't come back from that. There is no coming back. And so if I, I believe in a rapture that takes Christians out, which leaves a pretty terrible world in my, my opinion. But, 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 but just back up for a second, though. But that means God, you know, like, these, like the, you know, you've got the people on the cross and one of them doesn't believe, the other does. That guy, you'll be with me in paradise. But think about it. What is it you've got to do that's so bad in the process that to get that mark, to get that sign, you've done, you've done the ultimate sin or you've done something so bad, God says, it's not just that you took it. It's like to get that marks to, to me is what did it. Yeah. So this is really, this is the final chance. I think it's just the final straw kind of thing. Like this is you declaring sides. You've picked your side kind of at the last. You put the enemy uniform on. Exactly. Right. And right now we have grace. We have the, the covering of Christ and, and praise God for it because there are days where. And it's going to be rough. You may like maybe your children have sided with Antichrist. God forbid. I mean, there's going to yeah. be a moment where you're like, my family did it. I'm taking it fine. I bow down. Well, then you, it's just, no, you've got to say sorry. I mean, it, it. absolutely. You, you have to, and you're, it will cost you your life. Like you won't be able to buy or sell. It means you can't eat. Like maybe people will set up co-ops. There's a really cool series of books called Left Behind by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins yeah. that I read. When I was in high school, I started reading them and they came out over, I guess, the course of maybe 10 or 15 years. They wrote a ton of them. Really, really interesting stuff, but it describes, okay, well, you know, think of the practical things that could happen. Somebody can set up a co-op and have believers around the world There's some kind of a system where they're trying to kind of help people be fed and help people get moved out of cities that are, I guess, locking down. By the way, the UN and and, and the Rockefeller Foundation 10 years ago put out Plantopolis, and they said, we're going to put the people that won't take our chips and accept our system in these ghettos. Yeah. And it said they're going to have like, it describes that. So so even the enemy sees the same perspective. It's it's weird. Yeah, absolutely. And and so many people think that it's impossible for that system. I want to go back to this because this really is the test case. This is absolutely the test case. So we've talked about how COVID-19 mirrored how maybe the, a world government could take over because we need it because it's so bad, it's going to kill everybody. It's not going to kill everybody, right? It's so bad, it's going to kill everybody that everybody has to do this. Take it one step further. It's not just that the situation is dire and that we need to take these drastic economic measures and freedom kind of restricting measures. It's that people who speak out against it are worthy of death. How many celebrities did we see tweeting, F you, if you don't have the vaccine and you Screw come to the hospital. Screw your freedom. Yeah, exactly. Arnold Schwarzenegger, if you don't have the vaccine and you come to the hospital, you should die and somebody else should be taken care they of. They weren't resuscitating people with heart attacks in the United States because the hospital was too full and it wasn't. Exactly. None of these hospitals were too full. We've talked about this. Like That is the kind of mentality people will have. You are now an enemy. Not just an enemy ideologically not just somebody that i need to make sure doesn't run for office and win but somebody who should not have a job a way to provide for their family a place to live or even and that's why china is the model so from from your research the bible you've done a better job than i have i always remember in the in in sunday school and stuff they're going to be guillotines chopping christians heads off i mean what does the bible actually say about that versus what people made up 100 percent true so if you don't have the mark of the beast if you refuse to worship the uh, punishment of choice is separating you from your head which is typically fatal. That's a lot be, better than going to hell. It's supposed to be a joke, Alex. <laughs> no, no, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It is no, funny. But it's so, but it's so, so serious. Well, I'm that, a lot of people think, okay, well, what other world religion right now? Because it will come in under a world religion. Don't, don't, don't be fooled. Don't think that they're going to say God is not real. That's not what they're going to say. They're going to say, yes, God is real, but God is this. Right? They'll say you can still be Christian, but you're not really, you must accept every other religion. We have to accept all of these other things. What religion right now kills apostates by cutting off their heads? Islam. Islam. Absolutely. 
What regions are we talking about when we talk about some of the places that this all is going to happen? Middle East. Middle East. Do you think it's any surprise that that probably plays a prominent role? I have no idea. And Islam didn't exist for 400 years after the revelation. Well, it was, I think Islam came around in what, the 600s? Roughly? 500, 600 years. 500, yeah. 600, yeah. Something like that. This was, this was something, this guy was, I, I, didn't, I didn't even plan on getting to Islam, but this is a topic that I've studied a lot. This guy was rejected by the Jews. He wanted to be Jewish, but he was rejected. He was rejected by Christians as well. And then he kind of dabbled in some Zoroastrianism. Yeah, exactly. They're at the three. Mecca, or, yeah. or they're at the crossroads of, 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 the, of, the, of the east-west trade. Yeah. He watched all this. Absolutely, and he kind of based everything off of that. And what's really interesting, maybe we can do another one on this. Yeah. So when we talk about eschatology, there are players in this. Like there's the beast, there is the Antichrist, and, and so you've got kind of the false prophet. You've got all these kind of characters at play in Christianity, and we go, okay, those are the bad guys. The Messiah coming back, so Jesus coming back, that's the good guy. If you study Islamic eschatology, they have the same cast of characters, except the roles are reversed. All of the bad guys for them are the good guys, and our good guy actually becomes a prophet for them. Jesus is a prophet that actually comes and allows Muhammad to take center stage. It is absolutely mind-blowing when you dive into it. So, like, they believe this stuff, too. There's an eschatology to their game as well. There's an end times... Like the 12th Imam, one of my favorite authors, uh, Joel C. Rosenberg. Yeah, they believe starting nuclear war brings Jesus. Exactly. Yeah. It has to be so bad. Now think about that. If they think to bring back their kind of world order that they want, their, 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 their Messiah essentially, they have to make the world so bad. I just described to you a scenario where the world is going to get so bad that somebody coming to power, it's going to be very easy for us to hand over our freedom and our liberty because they'll make the world better and we need somebody to do that. These things line up. They think that they have to do that. We don't. We just know that it will happen. That's the mechanism. Well, it's just Again, wild how the Jews mechanism. sit there and come out with you know, the amazing stuff that's in the, the, the Torah, and then they're waiting for it. And then when it finally comes, it changes the whole world and empowers all these societies. Like, and, nope. And not it creates that the Renaissance and everything we have. Yeah. And they just go, nope, we're not accepting that. So here's why. Here's why the Jews missed it. So in the book of Isaiah, um, there are some prophecies that talk about Jesus, right? So there's some very clearly messianic prophecies um, that they overlook. Israel was expecting a conquering king because in scripture, it says that the Messiah will be a conquering king. That seems reasonable, right? What they didn't understand is that they missed that he would first be a suffering servant, that there are two times that the Messiah comes. They were looking for the second time. He came the first time and did this. And Jesus even quoted this, and, and, and I, I'll butcher the quote if I do it, but it's when he stands up and the, the scroll is unra unraveled and he reads kind of a thing from Isaiah and he stops. And where he stopped was actually a point where it's, I think it's talking about setting captives free, I, I think. Don't quote me on this. I could be just getting this a, a slight bit off. And he stops kind of at a comma, so to speak. The comma didn't exist. We inserted that, but he stopped right there. And right after that, it's referring to the second time when it's talking about judgment and destruction. And thank God he stopped. Because if he had come back the first time with condemnation for sinners, people who had completely rejected God, none of us would have had a chance. We wouldn't have been born in the first place, but people would not even have had a chance. But he stopped right there, and the Jews missed it because they saw present conditions suck. Rome occupies us. We don't even control And, and, and how are you going to get a Messiah that fixes everything if everybody doesn't go under it? Yeah. I mean, it's like the Messiah comes, everybody's got to follow it. Everybody has to. And so no. that's why they missed it. And so when it's hard for them to come back to it. But here's one of the other things that I'll tell you, kind of, kind of a wrapping up point as to why this all matters just a little bit more. One of the things that people get, I guess, confused about is all of the language of Revelation. Well, Revelation 1 through 3 is very clear. Very easy to understand. It's letters to churches. It's some admonitions. It's actually really interesting. The book of Revelation is the only book in the Bible with the audacity to say, as Chuck Missler would say, read me, I'm special. Because it basically promises a blessing to those who read and understand. It's the only book of the Bible that does that. So it's a very important thing to remember. Read that book. There is a blessing to people who read that book. First three chapters, pretty easy. You get to chapter four, the language changes. All of a sudden, you start to hear things that are very Jewish. Very, very Jewish. They start to tell stories that you don't really understand, and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't really understand what they're talking about with, with the moon and the stars and the sun and then this lady and this beast. It's just really strange. If you understand your Old Testament, that gets very clear very quickly. That is why the church has messed up so much on the book of Revelation, because the church doesn't spend a lot of time teaching you the Old Testament and giving you a verse-by-verse-by-verse by verse by verse 
understanding of what well, the well Bible Christ says. said he came to fulfill the Old Testament not to override it exactly he's like I came to fulfill all of the law not to get rid of it every single thing that has been said in scripture will be fulfilled but all of it is written of Christ the writ- the things that were written aforetime were for your benefit the Old Testament is very important if you understand your Old Testament you will understand the book of Revelation much, much better, and you won't fall victim to I think you have to know the Old theories. Testament to know the, to know the name. You do, but most people think about this. When you're a Christian, I mean, growing up in the 90s, I was a Christian, I was in church, and I read mostly the New Testament. I really wasn't studying the Old Testament until I got into my 20s and went to ministry school, and I was like, I just can't get enough of this. Like, this is explaining so much. Well, because we already <laughs> it's did starting it starting to make sense. We did it before. It's all the same stuff we did again. Right, exactly. Like, it's just repeating. <clears throat> the prophecy is pattern thing. Like, it, there are some things that will just blow your mind in Scripture where you're like, I had no idea that when, when Moses lifted up a snake on a, a brass snake and people looked upon it, they were healed of the afflictions. And Christ refers to that and says, just like when Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, the son of man will be lifted up and he who looks upon me will be healed. It was a pattern that he was laying down in scripture, but most people miss that because they never read the first story in the first and place. the pattern's key because it connects it all together energetically, spiritually. Yeah. And you see the patterns being fulfilled, right? God using patterns to kind of set prophecy and those things being fulfilled. So it's very important to understand the Old Testament. So I'd highly encourage you to do that. If you want to study the book of Revelation, there's a lot of great people out there that you can look at. I highly recommend Chuck Missler just because I think he's the right kind of teacher. He's humble. He'll talk to you about stuff that's interesting, but he'll say it's conjecture, not to hold on to that too tightly. But he'll also tell you verse by verse by verse and link you back to the Old Testament every single time. If there's one thing about what Chuck Missler did, he died in 2018, but he was just a phenomenal teacher. Um, He would take, I think, 30 hours to go through the book of Revelation and kind of walk you through all of this because he's going back to the Old Testament so much to kind of show you, okay, this is what it's talking about. Here's what this is talking about. Well, what's incredible is what I'm seeing the Great Awakening happening, the third great Christian awakening that we've had in the last 300 years, is, it, is it, it's not that the church is even teaching this when it should be because this is the reality. People are hungry for it. it it's that people are out in the world and seeing yeah. – the Satanism and the occultism and the devil worship and the 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 destruction and the attack on God, the attack on family, I mean, it really is satanic. And so if people think it's bad now, it's going to get crazier and crazier and crazier. Yeah. And so that's why people, I think, really need to understand that we're on a planet in space. We were given free will. God really did make us. There really is this outside force. You know, there's... All the new agers say it's space aliens or whatever. Well, I mean, what is the devil? It's an interdimensional creature stranded here with an army that wants to control us. Well, why is it? Because we're made in the image of God, and look what we imagine what we're able to build now. We're like babies still. Oh, yeah. The technology, the things we've done is nothing because we are actually more advanced than God's angels. And, and this is my layperson's, I mean, give me yeah, your take. I know, I know. But I mean, we are made in the image of God, we have eternal spirits. And God made other things before and decided to make us later. And these things are jealous of us and want to kill us well, and want to get rid of us. I mean, I mean, it's really... The demonic forces, yeah, absolutely. We should talk about... You know we'll talk about spiritual warfare in one second here. I, I think we'll we'll make that into another episode because I think that'll be really interesting. I, we should do a lot of episodes. I want to do them. Well, you know, I think we'll do that in a minute because that, that's really important. But look, to Alex's point, like the, we're held responsible as a believer, as a non whoever it is, it doesn't matter. You're held responsible for the information that you have access to. And right now... You have access to God saying, hey, you won't know the day and the hour. That's fine. Don't worry about that. Know the season. We're in the season. Whether that season is going to take a long time to fulfill, I'm not the guy saying, hey, in in two years, in five years, in ten years. I'm just saying that you need to be prepared because that's what God tells you to do. Not because I am saying that. Not because I'm trying to sell you some emergency supply kit or make you a great prepper. I'm just saying it is good for you to be ready. It's also good for you to know the end of the story. We win. We overcome this through Christ. Thank God, literally. Because the world is a very terrible place. It's very sad when you have movies coming up about human trafficking, and that's just one fraction of the debauchery that is on this planet. The things that we do to each other make God cry. And it all comes to an end, and he wipes away every single tear from every single eye. And you don't have to worry about that anymore. Evil is finally dealt with injustice. And, and I think that's something really important to say here. And I know we're taping this today, so when you put it in post, maybe you can add AOC and Al Gore and Beto saying, the world ends in 2030. They mean they're artificially collapsing things to consolidate power and depopulate. But, but, but really, 
it's Yuval Noah Harari and Bill Gates and them saying the future is not human. By 2047, there'll be no humans. You must merge the machines or we'll get rid of you. They're the ones saying it's the end of the world. Yeah. They are they are literally fulfilling prophecy. I remember my grandfather would say, the devil can't help it. He must follow God's plan. He will fulfill the prophecy. And that's the thing is, they think we're the ones saying into the world. No, we're trying to keep the gas pipelines going. We're trying to keep the nitrogen going. We're trying to keep the farming going. We're trying to stop wars, stabilize the third world. We're not like, oh, we want the end of the world. Let's drink no. Kool-Aid. It's the left and the globalist that are fulfilling it to bring in the crisis. And then they can stop the crisis because they're running it with their antichrist. Yeah. Well, in our next episode of this, we're actually going to dive into that because that's where spiritual warfare comes in. If you think that it's just maybe some demonic possession things where somebody's head spins around and they vomit green stuff at you, think again. It gets a little deeper than that. Thank you very much for being with us. That is Gerald. Apologizes Apologetics with Alex Jones. Great being with you. Gerald Apologizes Apologetics. It doesn't mean that. I told you it was going to be a very interesting conversation. Alex Jones for an hour on the end times. But look, we actually dove a little bit deeper into spiritual warfare. That portion is going to be released on Mug Club. So if you are not a member, make sure you join the network today. $89 annually. And you're going to gain access to the Hodge Twins Uncensored, Nick DiPaolo Show, Brian Callen's Weekly Show, Mr. Guns and Gear, and of course, the White Whale himself, Alex Jones. If you want to see more of these type shows, the apologetic shows, please leave us a comment and join. Join up now. Join us in the fight, guys. We will see you very soon.